after the Lord God created Adam, and as God was establishing the very first human-to-human -human relationship, he said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Let us make for him a helper suitable to him. The key word we must focus on in this verse when we discuss relationships is the word helper. And in Hebrew, it's pronounced azer. Interestingly, this Hebrew noun that we translate into English as helper is nearly identical, as you see, to the Hebrew noun we translate as treasure. And both words are based on a Hebrew verb that means to help. So Proverbs connects these concepts, saying, who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. So her value is far above all earthly treasure. It cannot be calculated. Thus, the passage explains, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of goodness. Or in other words, she speaks, this virtuous woman speaks the wisdom of God's law that defines good. And that is also an invaluable treasure. As Psalm 19 teaches, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. So scripture teaches that a virtuous wife is similar to God's judgments and that both are more valuable than anything that is treasured in this world today. And the reason is this, both God's judgments and a godly spouse, they both help us continue walking in the narrow, difficult road that leads to eternal life. So the proverb where the two verses we've examined so far is located concludes by stating the following. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Now the word there translated as charm is translated as adornment in the third chapter of Proverbs. And as we'll see later, it is most certainly the deceitfulness of adornment that the proverb is warning about. Plus, when the proverb states that beauty is vain, it could actually be just as literally translated, beauty is futility, beauty is fleeting, beauty is empty, or beauty is useless. Let me ask, do we base agape love on beauty? No. Do we base phileo love on beauty? No. So you see the love beauty is eliciting is a sensory, physical manifestation of Eros love. Beauty and Eros love are connected. So when physical attraction is the foundation of a marital relationship, that relationship is built on a very shallow and very unstable foundation. For this reason, the Lord said to Samuel, and this applies to every situation, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Sadly, many people twist that verse out of context to claim People can worship God with pagan tainted practices while saying, quote unquote, the Lord looks at the heart or God examines the heart. That's not at all what that passage was teaching. The passage is commanding us never to favor or disregard anyone based on immutable characteristics of physical outward appearance, but instead to look at their conduct because conducts flows from and reveals their heart. Immutable physical characteristics like height, 
skin color, hair color, body shape, even transient characteristics like poverty or illness or handicap, they must not be used to judge anyone or consider anyone ineligible for courtship or marriage. But conduct that reveals immodesty, vanity, or any other disobedience to God's word can and should be considered as evidence of ineligibility for courtship. Remember, adornment is deceitful, and beauty is futility, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. For this reason, outward beauty is never mentioned in Proverbs 18.22, which records, he who has found a good wife has found favors and has received favor from God. Yes, a good wife is an invaluable treasure and a blessing from God, a tangible manifestation of God's amazing grace. But truly a good wife is one who loves the Lord's word and fears the Lord. Meanwhile, when we place a value on our relationships and even prioritize them according to such values, we must recognize that only God can deliver us from sin and death. Therefore, we treasure our relationship with God above all others and measure every relationship based on our relationship with God. But next, we must treasure our spouse and value our relationship with them above all other human relationships. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's why we refer to finding a spouse as the second most important decision you will ever make. But the scriptures are clear. It is a virtuous and good wife who fears the Lord that is a treasure, but evil company always corrupts good morals. So because choosing a good spouse is such an important decision, and it involves all of the potential dangers of Eros love, a careful, deliberate, principled process of spousal selection that involves the authority of God and parents must be employed. Historically, as we have learned, that process is called courtship. And when we remember the walls of the court are the commandments of our God, it helps us never lose focus on the most important relationship in our lives, the one that requires us to love God first and foremost by keeping all of his commandments. If we're tempted ever to break any of God's commandments, to pursue any relationship with any person on this earth, including the commandments to honor our parents, then we should immediately recognize that relationship is leading us to violate the protective boundaries of God's commandments, so it is a relationship that must end immediately. We cannot claim to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength while we sin against God to pursue a relationship with someone else. And those who leave the boundaries of the Lord's commandments to pursue earthly relationships are leaving behind God's protection. They're leaving behind God's relationship they have with him and possibly their place in the kingdom of heaven if they don't repent. For this reason, Jesus said, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. And later, our brother Jude, or more literally translated Judah, admonished, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. It's up to you and I to keep yourself in the love of God. So we must never forget that scripture teaches when all has been heard, the conclusion is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act into judgment, including which is hidden, everything which is hidden, hidden, whether it's good or evil. 
The fact is obedience to the word of God, including all of his commandments, is the true test Christians must apply to any person they might consider a prospect for marriage. And one of the easiest ways you can preliminarily judge a book is by examining its cover. If the cover of a book contains filthy language, should you read that book? If the cover of a book displays immoral images, should you even open such a book? If the cover obviously promotes a lie, is it an appropriate book for a saint? Obviously not. Despite the common but unbiblical expression, you cannot judge a book by its cover, you can actually tell quite a lot about the book by the cover the author chose to adorn their, their work with. Similarly, if we notice immoral, disobedient choices in the way a person dresses or doesn't dress their body, those choices at the very minimum indicate they don't yet know what God's word teaches about clothing. How can you recognize if someone's obeying the command to keep the Sabbath holy? How can you observe if someone is obeying the command to have no other gods besides our Lord? How can you determine if someone's obeying the command not to bear false witness by their fruit? Obviously, when we see people disobey these commandments, we properly identify the perpetrators as lawless. But why do people think we should not identify lawlessness when we see people violating equally plain commandments in the word of God? Without a doubt, you can begin to identify when a person knows, believes, and obeys God's word by simply observing how they dress their physical body. Because scripture has very clear guidelines on the subject of clothing. For example, the Lord's servant Peter wrote, do not let your adornment be outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let your adornment be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. That's how you adorn yourself. The word merely was added by some false teacher turned translator to that passage in many translations, but Peter did not include such a word or such an idea. Peter said our adornment should not be outward, period. We should not wear fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or fine clothing. That's not a suggestion, it's a command penned by the Apostle Peter and included in the inspired scriptures by the Holy Spirit. Christians should not dress like the world, nor should we participate in worldly fleshly pageants of outward adornment in modesty and vanity. But Peter wasn't the only apostle inspired to write such a command. Let this matter be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses Similarly, the Apostle Paul wrote, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also, meaning I desire, therefore, also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but that which is proper for women professing godliness, adornment with good works. Once again, scripture explicitly forbids outward adornments involving fancy, expensive, or otherwise showy hair, jewelry, or clothing. But just as Peter encouraged the inward adornment of a gentle, quiet spirit, Paul encouraged the outward adornment of good works. They're quite specific. These commandments are plainly recorded in Scripture. But because pastors rarely discuss them, most Christians in this world disobey these things on a regular basis. But despite this widespread failure of leadership in regards to clothing, Scripture most certainly teaches us to wear modest apparel. 
Now, the Greek word Paul used that's translated as apparel is katastole. And it means lowering, letting down, a garment that's let down, a dress. The root word of that term comes from the verb katastello, which means to send or put down, to lower. So after all these words that say put down, lower, what do you think Paul would say about short, revealing clothing if he used a term based on the verb to lower, to put downward, to refer to the garments Christians should wear? Scripture is clear, revealing the thigh is revealing one's nakedness. And to reveal one's mature nakedness to anyone we're not married to is most certainly shameful according to the Bible. Thus, as a judgment, God said, come and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Remove your veil. Take off the skirt. Uncover the thigh. Pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Yes, your shame shall be seen. Because revealing the thigh is the equivalent to revealing one's nakedness, God commanded the priest to approach his altar on a rib instead of steps and wear trousers underneath his garments. So, the word translated as propriety in Paul's letter to Timothy about how Christians are to dress is ahitos, and it means a sense of shame or honor, modesty, or bashfulness. Contrary to the satanic thinking of this present evil age, the Bible teaches that exposing our nakedness, which includes our thighs, to anyone but our spouse, is exceedingly shameful. Jesus spoke of this when he said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. You see, the way pagans expose their nakedness is shameful. It should never be emulated by Christians in any way. But we need to understand the term nakedness as scripture describes it. Likewise, we must learn how scripture speaks about proper clothing. In the world, fashion was invented to sell more clothing to satisfy the greed of the clothing industry. You change the fashion and people spend more money. But immodesty was invented in this world by Satan to lead souls to hell through lust. But those who have a biblical worldview founded on God's word understand that clothing only has one legitimate primary purpose. And that purpose is to conceal nakedness. Did you notice I didn't say the purpose of clothing is to cover nakedness? Well, there's a very specific reason I used the verb conceal. But before we learn about that reason, please notice the difference between covering and concealing. Are both of these cars covered? Which car is more concealed? The one on the left or the one on the right? Which covering is more revealing? Can you see all of the car's shape through the tight fabric on the left car? Can you guess what model of car this is when you look at the equivalent of an immodest car cover? Beyond the color of the car on the left, what else is left to your imagination? Which cover is providing better protection from thieves? 
If you knew someone with a sinful desire to steal expensive cars, which car cover is more likely to make them stumble? Please remember these vehicles and their very different covers when we read the following verse and learn about the very specific word the Lord himself used when he described the purpose of clothing. In Exodus, the Lord, our God, our creator said, and you shall make for the priest linen pants, mistranslated to cover the indecency of their flesh. From the loin unto the thighs they shall be. But the words translated here incorrectly as cover, it is the Greek word kalupto. That means to hide, to veil, or literally to hinder the knowledge of, of a thing. Similarly, the Hebrew Masoretic text records God using the Hebrew word kasa, which means to cover, conceal, or hide. Does skin tight clothing hide a body, veil a body, or hinder the knowledge of the shape of a person's body? No, it does not do that. So such garments do not meet the biblical definition of clothing because the Bible teaches that clothing must perform those functions. The skin type clothing conceal or just cover? Scripture commands us to conceal our nakedness, to feel ashamed if our nakedness is exposed outside the privacy of marriage and to dress with propriety, modesty, and moderation. So Christians must reject this relatively recent, wicked, worldly trend towards skin-tight clothing. And we must choose clothing that actually hides or conceals our bodies, that quote unquote, the shame of our nakedness may not be revealed. A good and simple test would be this. Can you put your hand between your clothing and your body and still conceal the presence and shape of your hand? If you can, congratulations. Your clothing is probably loose enough to conceal your nakedness. But if the outline or presence of your hand can be easily seen, your clothing is not loose enough to conceal your nakedness. Please remember, clothing is supposed to, by definition, hide or conceal your nakedness, not just cover it. That's why Jesus said, I counsel you to buy from me white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. The word Jesus used, translated as revealed, is phanero. And it means to make manifest or visible or known what has been hidden or unknown. Your nakedness is to remain hidden and unknown to all but your spouse. Therefore, the total concealment of nakedness is the purpose, the definition of clothing. Mankind has struggled since Genesis to properly conceal their nakedness. Yes, scripture records that the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. The word here translated as coverings is kagur. And it means loin covering. So when Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together in their attempt to define clothing, they only made coverings that obscured the very basins, their loins. Next, scripture records God correcting them and showing us how all clothing should actually work. It says, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. When God made clothing for Adam and Eve, he made what the Bible calls tunics in our translation. But according to Strong's Concordance, God made them kenoneth, which means coats or robes. 
here you see one. The Hebrew word in Genesis 3.21 describes a long garment that loosely hangs from the shoulders and loosely continues down beyond the waist to the knees or to the ankle. This is why Jesus always assumed his apostles wore belts to hold these loose garments reasonably tight to their waist. So God made a much more modest and decent form of clothing for Adam and Eve than they made for themselves. And since godly people always take God's word to heart in every area of their lives, including how they dress their bodies that were bought with the very blood of Jesus Christ, from creation throughout all of biblical history, Clothing like the tunics the Lord God made for Adam and Eve were worn by the biblically obedient. That's why every movie you see shows them dressed like this. For example, as we read, Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. This passage is actually telling us a lot about the prophet's appropriate biblical clothing. Because men and women all throughout the Bible all wore long, loose, fitting, ankle-length robes or tunics as they ran, they had to, prior to running, gird up their loins, as shown in the picture. They did this to turn their long, flowing, dress-like garments into an ancient pair of shorts. Not short shorts, mind you, but knee-high shorts, because all of them believed showing your thigh was showing your nakedness. But this was all accomplished by gathering up all the loose fabric, pulling it up between the legs, possibly twisting it, and then tucking it into your belt. This style of clothing was the norm all throughout Scripture. So Peter writes, therefore gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully on the grace that's to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This metaphor doesn't work if his people he's writing to don't still dress like the man on your screen. So all throughout biblical history, both the male and female saints, but not their pagan contemporaries, they all wore long, loose-fitting, ankle-length, often, clothing. So that's why Peter used the metaphor of girding up the loins of the mind. He knew that all of his readers would easily understand how the metaphor of preparing your robes to run applied to preparing our minds for the spiritual race that lays ahead, bringing every thought into captivity to obedience to Christ. Likewise, Paul makes it clear certain parts of our body must be hidden. He writes, those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. So Paul's words in Romans 14 should also be applied to clothing for most men and women. He writes, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything, including dress improperly, in a way that makes your brother stumble or offends them or makes them weak. Like eating meat or drinking wine, we must not destroy the work of God for the sake of vanity, immodesty, or fashion. Instead, we must make sure our clothing is above reproach in decency and modesty so we never offend or weaken any brother or sister in the Lord. And if that means we don't dress like the pagans, that's nothing new. Our holy brethren all throughout history dressed their bodies differently than all the people that surrounded them. In fact, the way they dressed set them apart. It was the beauty of holiness. So remember, our king is warned, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offense 
comes. We should hide our nakedness out of a sense of modesty, as well as a visible manifestation of our pursuit of godliness and holiness. Would Jesus wear something like that? No. If all this fails, may the fear of the Lord be one more reason we all must hide our nakedness. Jesus will not look kindly on anyone who causes even the least of his servants to sin by dressing immodestly. One example of an immodest woman can be found in Proverbs chapter 7. There, a woman with no shame announced her wickedness proudly through her filthy clothing. Scripture records, my son, keep my words and hide my commandments with you. My son, honor the Lord and you shall be strong and fear none but him. Keep my commandments and you shall live. Keep my words as the pupils of your eyes and bind them on your fingers and write them on the tablet of your heart. Say that wisdom is your sister and gain prudence as an acquaintance for yourself that she may keep you from the strange and wicked woman if she should assail you with flattering words. Scripture warns, she looks from a window out from her house into the streets at one whom she may see of the senseless ones, a young man devoid of understanding passing by the corner in the passages near her house and speaking in the dark of evening when there happens to be the stillness of night and of darkness and the woman meets him having the clothing of a harlot that causes the hearts of young men to flutter and she is fickle and rebellious and her feet abide not at home for at one time she wanders outside and at another time she lies in wait in the streets at every corner then she caught him and kissed him and the passage concludes of this wicked woman by warning so with much conversation she prevailed on him to go astray and with the snares of her lips forced him from the right path and he followed her being gently led on as that of an ox led to the slaughter and as a dog led to bondage or as a deer shot in the liver with an arrow and he hastens as a bird into the snare not knowing that he's running for his life now then, my son, listen to me and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. For she, the immoral, immodest woman, has wounded and cast down many. And those whom she has slain are innumerable. Her house is the way of hell leading down to the chambers of death. Unless you desire death and hell, when someone's publicly worn clothing can be described as the clothing of a harlot, or the way someone dresses causes young men's hearts to flutter, run, run from such a person. Non-marital public expressions of immodest clothing should only attract positive attention from immoral people. But those of us who fear the Lord and obey God's commandments should only think negatively towards all types of immodest clothing in public spaces. Immodesty is an expression of immorality. Even Wikipedia knows this. It says modesty is a mode of dress and deportment which intends to avoid the encouraging of sexual attraction in others. The word modesty comes from the Latin word modestus, which means keeping within measure. Immodesty is an expression of immorality, 
It leads to sin and death and hell and destruction. So all biblically minded Christians will only desire to establish a relationship with other people who dress modestly and morally and abhor immodesty. Therefore, clothing is one fruit we must examine when we consider a potential spouse. And after we examine how a spousal candidate clothes themselves, we can examine then what they think of worldly people who do dress immodestly. First, make sure they look like one of these two if they go swimming. And second, see what they do when other people walk by who don't dress like them. Do they turn away from the immoral, immodest people of this filthy world and avoid media with images of such wickedness? Or do they seem unfazed when such things appear before them? God said Job was a righteous man. So every Christian should follow Job's righteous example. And scripture records that Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes and I will not take notice of a maiden. Now what portion has God given from above? Is there an inheritance given of the mighty one from on high? Alas, destruction to the unrighteous and rejection to them that do iniquity. Will he not see my way and number all my steps? Godly men and women turn away their eyes from immodesty. They know God sees all their deeds and he will punish the wicked for their lawlessness. So they would rather pluck out an eye and cast it from them before willingly filling their eyes with the temptation of wickedness. So mark and avoid all those who don't turn away from the immorality and immodesty on display all around us and follow the path that Job followed. But along with immodesty, Vanity and deception should also be avoided by every Christian. So please consider with me in this world's culture when people use the word make up in a sentence about a person's face, it becomes a noun describing types of face paint traditionally applied in a mirror table they literally call a vanity. You can't make this up. And even within the world's ungodly culture from a standard worldly dictionary, when we break down that same word makeup into the two English words it's comprised of and place the words make up together in a sentence as a verb, typically that sentence is about deception. Please notice when used as a verb, the phrase makeup often describes someone deceptively discussing something that doesn't actually exist. Take a good, long look at those pictures. Even the heathens say a woman is made up when she has that face paint applied. And that's a true statement. She is made up. All the marked false images are of a person who does not exist. Makeup is a face paint used to fabricate a face that God never made. It doesn't exist. God didn't create it. They do this to deceptively allure men or simply draw undue attention to themselves. Lately, perverted men employ the exact same types of makeup and the same types of immodesty to pretend they're women. Either way, the worldly tools of deception and immodesty are involved. They're all buying their clothes at the same department, getting their makeup at the same counter. So perhaps if makeup and outrageous immodesty didn't exist in modern feminine culture, it would also dissuade such male emulation. But please understand, archaeologists have discovered that Egyptian pagans practiced the same deceptive face painting long ago, probably in the time of Moses. 
and they uncovered the oldest evidence of makeup buried in an ancient Egyptian tomb. Therefore, because face painting has always been a pagan custom for thousands of years, the Bible actually addresses it quite clearly in three different passages. Let's learn about the Bible's position on makeup. The first passage describes a woman you're probably familiar with. Her name is Jezebel. She's the quintessential immoral woman, and it records now, when Jehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. So what did she do? She put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a window. Then as Jehu entered the gate, she said, is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? And he looked up at the window and said, who is on my side, who? So two or three eunuchs looked out at him. Then he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses. And Jehu trampled her underfoot. When he had gone in, he ate and drank. Then he said, now go. See to this accursed woman and bury her for she was a king's daughter. So they went to bury Jezebel, but they found no more of Jezebel than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore they came back and told him. And he said, ah, this is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite saying, on the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the corpse of Jezebel shall be as garbage on the surface of the field in the plot at Jezreel so they shall not say here lies Jezebel now not every person who paints their face will be thrown down from a window trampled by horses and eaten by dogs but they will all be emulating the footsteps of Jezebel who was our next passage is a prophecy describing how the Lord perceived Israel and Judah to be like two immoral sisters committing harlotry against him by repeatedly violating his covenant. Through Ezekiel, our God said these words, you washed yourself for them, painted your eyes and adorned yourself with ornaments. You sat on a stately couch with a table prepared before it, on which you had set my incense and my oil. The sound of a carefree multitude was with her, and Sabaeans were brought from the wilderness with men of the common sort, who put bracelets on her wrists and beautiful crowns on their heads. Thus they went in to Ohola and Oholiba, the lewd women. For thus says the Lord God, bring up an assembly against them. Give them to trouble and plunder. The assembly shall stone them with stones and execute them with their swords. They shall slay their sons and their daughters and burn their houses with fire. Thus I will cause lewdness to cease from the land that all women may be taught not to practice your lewdness. Not all people who wear makeup necessarily practice the harlotry that Israel and Judah practiced, and not all people who wear makeup will be stoned to death or slaughtered with the sword. But since there's only three examples of face paint in the Bible, those who paint their faces like Ohola and Oholiba walk in the footsteps of the sisters the Lord labeled the lewd women. Same practice. And God judged them with the stated intention that all women may be taught not to practice such lewdness. Now this brings us to our third passage about makeup in the Bible. This passage, the third and final that I'm aware of, is about Jerusalem. And through his prophet Jeremiah, the Lord said to unfaithful Jerusalem, say to this people and to Jerusalem, 
there is a spirit of error in the wilderness. And please note these words. The way of the daughter of my people is not to purity nor to holiness. That's what God wanted. But because he didn't get what he commanded, a spirit of full vengeance shall come upon me. And now I declare my judgments against them. Behold, he shall come up as a cloud and his chariots as a tempest. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are in misery. Cleanse your heart from wickedness, O Jerusalem, that you may be saved. How long will your grievous thoughts be within you? So all they have to do is turn back to purity and turn back to holiness. But they didn't. Instead, they turned to worldliness. What will you do? Though you clothe yourself with scarlet, and adorn yourself with gold and ornaments, though you adorn your eyes with paint, your adornment will be in vain. Your lovers have rejected you, they seek your life. God was judging Jerusalem for her spiritual harlotry, but he described her once again as an immoral woman, and just like Jezebel and the two lewd sisters, she adorned herself outwardly with flashy clothing and expensive jewelry, painted her face to entice Babylon with deceptive ornaments. But Babylon, by God's will, turned against her because God was using Babylon to bring up his judgment against Jerusalem's immorality. This is what the Bible says about makeup. Every single example of face painting in the Bible is applied to immoral women using deceptive immodesty and made up faces God never created to attract attention or men. Each description ends in terrible judgment and each example is presented as an exact description of conduct saints should never congratulate, reward, or emulate. On the other hand, now to the positive example. Scripture never describes the bride of Christ as adorning her face with paint or clothing her body in any vain garments. No immodest clothing will be on the bride of Christ, and she never conducts herself with anything resembling vanity. She adorns herself in purity and in holiness and embraces the way God made her. The scriptures say, let us rejoice and be exceedingly glad and let us give God glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his wife has prepared herself. And to her it was granted that she should be dressed in fine linen, bright and pure, See, purity is in the definition, and the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Unlike Jerusalem in Jeremiah's time, the bride of Christ faithfully prepares for her wedding day by consistently walking in the way of purity and holiness. She is content with the natural beauty God has given her, and she feels no need to sit down in a vanity and vainly enhance her beauty. She adorns herself in modesty and virtue and righteousness. Her nakedness cannot be seen and her righteous acts are her adornment, not ornate hairstyles or fancy clothing or a painted face or expensive jewelry. Her good deeds are her beauty. Her holiness is her beauty. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Young men, if you're seeking a godly wife, look for such a pure and holy woman and be pure and holy young men, young women. If you are seeking a godly Christ-like husband, conduct yourself in a way that reflects the values of your heavenly king and the right young man will find you. 
We must apply all these words to our outward appearance and do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than ourselves. True beauty is not defined by the world. It is not outward. It has nothing to do with face paint. It is not fleshly. It cannot be painted on, and it doesn't come from a store. True, biblical beauty is defined by the Lord. It is inward, it is spiritual, and it flows out of obedience to God's holy word. So we can tell a lot about a book by the cover it chooses for itself. Fleshly people are concerned with fleshly expressions of beauty. Spiritual people are concerned with spiritual expressions of beauty. So scripture warns, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit occupy their minds. For to be fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the fleshly mind is at enmity with God, for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh, who think in fleshly ways, cannot please God. Vanity, immodesty, and other outwards expressions of fleshly thinking should be warning signs that repel a Christian from a spousal candidate. Meanwhile, outward attractiveness is typically what draws fleshly-minded, worldly people towards each other. So beware of thinking like the world, saints. Beware of connecting yourself to anyone who thinks like the world. If someone is fleshly-minded, they cannot please God and they will lead you away from God. For these many reasons, never forget. Adornment is deceitful, and beauty is futility. But a woman who fears the Lord, she is to be praised.